The military regime of Kotoka Ankara Afrifa that assumed economic management of Ghana from 1966 to 1969 did not, for whatever reasons, deviate much from the strategies they inherited. Agriculture still accounted for 70% of all output and had a work or labour force of 75% of the working population. Manufacturing notwithstanding, the strategy of import substitution industrialization of Inchroma had not yielded the expected results. Services were no better. Uh, we followed that with uh, uh, the first military government not having any particular orientation in terms of where to move the economy. Even though they continued with uh, uh, the dominance of state enterprises, so you will find, for example, that despite the rhetoric, the number of state enterprises increased uh, in the military regime that followed in Krumah, and also continued to increase under the first uh, civilian regime uh, that followed it, namely the uh, Buzia government of the Progress Party. Uh, what is interesting about the Buzia government was the emphasis on rural development. So you will, uh, to the credit of the Buzia government, you will find that uh, emphasis on things like rural roads or what we call feeder roads uh, really uh, took off. Uh, rural electrification took off, rural water programs took off under the Buzia government. But unfortunately, uh, no much effort was made to uh, link all these rural development initiatives with uh, the uh, bigger picture of uh, in enhancing employment, enhancing uh, production uh, at the aggregate level. Uh, so yes, we, we develop rural roads, uh, we develop rural electrification, we develop rural water, uh, and yet it, uh, uh, but uh, made no effort to relate them to production in, in a very serious manner. Uh, so, so, so here's a situation where an earlier government had put a lot of em uh, emphasis on production without developing adequately the desired infrastructure. Then another government comes and puts most of its efforts into putting in place the infrastructure, uh, forgetting uh, in relative terms the direct manufacturing or, or production of the goods and services. Many economists and commentators on Ghana have not failed to blame political instability as retarding Ghana's promise. The Buzia civilian government could only be in power for two and a half years before Ghana suffered from yet another military takeover, the Kitu Achimpong government, which was to run from 1972 to 1978. The reasons for such takeover were economic, but there is no indication that the economic fortunes of the country were improved by the military. Each political regime, starting from Nkrumah, has uh, made some claims to specific economic projects. It could be infrastructure, it could be uh, others. And um, they pinpoint to this to say that, well, there been there, there was some amount of growth during our period, this was done, this was done. Why then hasn't Ghana progressed further if all the regimes can pinpoint to certain development uh, achievements? If you look at the military government that replaced the Buzia government, they, of course, were a champion. They were very concerned about uh, uh, the distribution of uh, the goods and services being produced. So the Achampong government, for example, in its first few years, uh, put a lot of emphasis on Operation Feed Yourself, if you may recall that, and then Operation Feed Your Industries. Uh, it's not much different from uh, what others may call self-reliance. Uh, the whole idea being that instead of importing many of the things that we consume or use for our industry, let's produce them here. Uh, that principle or the motive is not really different from what Kevin Crow was trying to do with his uh, import substitution industrialization program. 
The Hillelimang government finally emerged after the first Rawlings intervention in the June 1979 uprising or housing cleaning exercise, which was the last but one such takeover. A bloody uprising, it was remembered for its overthrow of another military government, the Akufu Supreme Military Council II, which had displaced Anchenpong, all of which lasted from 1972 to 1979, without, for whatever little good it brought, not much impetus for growth and development. The Hillelimang government from 1979 to 1981 saw a reversion to planning in the economy, a five-year development plan, which had as technical head Dr Gobin Nankani, the future vice president of the World Bank for Africa. The mandate was to prepare a plan and send it to the International Monetary Fund for negotiation. And that was when we actually got very close to an agreement with the IMF, again based on an analysis done with a technical team at home of our own situation. And this whole um, scheme of, of um, paying exporters higher prices on the basis of import duties was actually developed also at that time in 1981. Uh, in the end, the government, President Lee Man's government, put that aside didn't go for a fund agreement and a lot of the work that was begun then was then picked up by me and some others who were aware of it uh, in 82-83 and finally led to an, an agreement. If all governments through these snippets contributed in one way or the other to some form of structural reforms these were still not coordinated and of no major impact. The economic history of Ghana has numerous examples of policy discontinuity, no matter how good, as that had been one of the reasons to justify military or other intervention. But soon the major or mother of all Ghanaian military takeovers in terms of longevity and level of bloodshed and containment of civil liberties occurred when Jerry John Rawlings came again, the second return, as it was properly called, on December 31st, 1981. The Provisional National Defence Council was born. The President, the Vice President and all Ministers and their deputies are dismissed from office. B. Parliament is dissolved. C. The Council of State is abolished. D. All political parties are prescribed. <laughs> Again, it was the economy that the soldiers said had gone wrong. A socialist-inspired revolution, it went beyond Nkrumah's rhetoric stance in the months before his overthrow. When conditions got worse and the Libyans and Russians could not help, something had to be done. The 1983 Economic Recovery Programme with the World Bank. Incidentally, it would be the first major reform of the Ghana economy. Behind the rhetoric, some of the serious work was done by economists such as Joe Abbey. Here was a country that had lived beyond its means. You could see all around us decay, potholes, railway lines that were just run down, no airlines to talk about. Um, the transport fleet was gone. So here was a country that did not even put back the wear and tear. You couldn't produce any longer. Others have different explanations to give. Well, when Rawlings came to power, he did not see the um, economic setup as a problem, but just the implementation. So he advocated strict adherence to price, price controls. He didn't believe that the price controls in and of themselves were the major problems, just a strict adherence to, uh, to them. So um, the result was that uh, with a quite uh, heavy handed, uh, uh, handedness, they, they adhered to, to the pr price controls. And, the and what happened is that massive shortage uh, um, arose because no one was willing to provide at the prevailing price in the market. Um, secondly, was a lack of materials. Um, and thirdly, there was a deterioration of the terms of trade. Um, so, uh, 
as with the previous um, administrations, there was a huge lack of foreign reserves. Um, the foreign reserves ha had been um, kind of uh, gone down to about one or two percent of GDP. So he went on a mission to the Soviet Union to ask for money. Moses Asaga trained in petroleum engineering and financial economics in South Korea and Durham in the United Kingdom and later joined the Rawlings government. Well, uh, first of all, the economic recovery program was a World Bank uh, instrument that is meant for economies that had broken down. And at the 83 that you were talking about, you will notice that the Ghanaian economy uh, was really very, very weak. It was in a downturn. Inflation was almost about 140 percent. Infrastructure was almost destroyed. Um, uh, goods and services were almost absent. So when the Ghana government decided to have a program with the World Bank, they thought that the first instrument to use would be the economic recovery program. And the word recovery speaks a lot for itself, that you want to turn around. So when we subscribed to that program, uh, initially what they were supposed to do was to make sure that the IMF supported the budget and then it also supported the Bank of Ghana with foreign exchange so that we'll be able to import in the needed uh, goods and services that were critical in the economy. So that was the purpose of the economic recovery program. It was not only the economy, including its energy sector, that had collapsed, but the personnel with the requisite skills to help correct it were in short supply. The military government negotiated with the Commonwealth to get on board in 1988 Dr Charles Wareko Broby, solar energy engineer, as an advisor and director of the National Energy Board. The role of energy in the embarked upon economic recovery programme was critical. So we're in a military regime, therefore the structure of government was quite different. But I, I had a dual role as policy advisor and also at the time head of the National Energy Board and was very much integrated into, into the work of the ministry. So our work basically was first of all um, to co coordinate the production of the first coherent energy policy um, framework for Ghana which we call it Energy and Ghana Social Economic Development and it looked at how we're going to move from the situation of uh, energy deficiency to one of surplus and relay that to what the key social economic objectives of, of government were. So that was, that was very much um, the work. And we looked at, uh, in terms of power generation, we looked at how, how, what we're going to do to add um, thermal complementation to the Akosombo Dam. We looked at how we're going to increase the use of petroleum use in the country and also to ensure that um, sources like petroleum and electricity were widely available. because. If you go back to what I was saying about part of the problem we had with the uh, industrialization strategy for, for, of the first president, you realize that many of the areas of our country which have the raw materials needed to produce value-added industrial products, most of those areas were not served with energy or electricity or reliable petroleum resources. So therefore, if you're going to set up factories, that will turn uh, basic agricultural produce into into value-added um, end, end products. And there was no electricity or reliable supply of petroleum products or reliable roads to ensure transportation or even reliable electricity to good, give telecommunications, etc. Then it, it wasn't going to work. So one of the things we focused on essentially at the time was to establish what we call the National Electrification Program, which aimed at the over a 30-year period to extend electricity to every community in the country which had a population of 500 or more. But we tied this to uh, um, the decentralization policy because everybody realized that there was an over-concentration of administrative power in the center. But then we realized that if you're going to decentralize and the heart of the decentralized uh, government structure was not adequately served by basic infrastructure, then you're not going to make much progress. So we established the National Electrification Program, the first focus of which was to ensure that every district capital in the country was given electricity within a, a period of about four or five years. Because with electricity, you could have proper water, you could establish proper communications, you could establish proper health 
care facilities, etc., etc. And I'm pleased to say, uh, by and large, that was achieved. Mm -hmm. uh, the second part of the electrification program was then to extend it through the self-help electrification program, which is to ensure that all communities get self. We are all very worried about the drift to Accra, the population intensity, but at the end of the day, we, we can only really encourage a decentralized um, uh, governance structure if within every community there are basic uh, infrastructure and utility services. So that really was the core mm. of, of, of that uh, energy policy. We coupled that with building um, strategic and storage depots for all petroleum products around the country so that now, now we have depots in every region of the country. We have pipelines that carry uh, petroleum products from uh, Accra to Akosombo. We use the lake to carry uh, products to the north. Pipelines are just being built to go from the north to the border. So that again, every part of the country would, would be well served with the, with the provision of uh, products. We were a little bit ahead of ourselves in looking at, uh, for example, um, global warming, etc. We used to flare a lot of natural, I mean, a lot of LPG gas from the refinery, and we thought that one way in which we could improve uh, energy use and energy efficiency and um, uh, be sensitive to the climate was to switch much of the cooking here from firewood, charcoal, to LP gas. Um, it's been extremely successful and I, I believe that uh, it continues to be quite successful. So the, the, the elements of Ghana's uh, formalized energy policy and, and plan were laid out in around 1989-92 and I think um, not, not much has changed. It's really the challenges have been how to, how to implement and sustain it, implementation. The role of energy in the manufacturing and mining sectors recorded some achievements, but the economy was still heavily dependent on gold and other natural resources and, of course, cocoa. And more restructuring had to be discussed and done. Uh, we mine mainly gold. In fact, of the mining revenue, about 95% is from gold, which sometimes frightens me because it's almost like a mono economy. Uh, we have bauxite and we have manganese. Um, we have bauxite in three major areas. One is Awaso, which is the only one which is being mined now. Another large deposit is in Yenehini, which might be mined pretty soon, maybe in the next two years or so. Then the other one is in Chebi, which I hope will also get mined. Um, in terms of export, both manganese and bauxite is uh, exported in its raw form, although prepared ready for industry. In terms of bauxite, uh, I think government is making plans to uh, have um, alumina produced in Ghana. It would really improve even the revenue we get from bauxite. Bauxite in its raw form only gets about $21 per ton, T-O-N-N-E, you know, and manganese also about that. But I think when you produce uh, alumina, it increases threefold, and when you produce the ingots of aluminum, even better still. So uh, I hope that the country does that. Uh, gold is also exported in a purity of about 80, maybe 91%. But in terms of selling gold, you want 99.9. .9. So it has to go to a refinery. Joyce Aye thinks of this as backward integration into the Ghanaian economy. By backward in integration, I mean creating uh, the facilities where companies can come and establish here. Local companies as well as foreign companies maybe produce the things that the mining companies will need rather than always importing them. I think as a country, if we really want to benefit from mining, that is what we should be doing. We should be making sure that it's an integrated industry. At the Kandeshi 6 and 7 schools at Matahiko in Accra, voting began at exactly 7 o'clock. In 1990, there was a strong desire on the part of Ghanaians to return to a constitutional rule. And so there was a change of government after a fiercely contested election in 1992. 
Rawlings, who had formed the National Democratic Congress, the NDC, won against the major opposition, New Patriotic Party, Ghana's long-established Liberal and Conservative Party. Moses Asaga knows very well that the military's inability to diversify the economy and the carriage of this into the constitutional era of 1992 was a big problem. They had been able to tar 2,000 miles of road and before the economic recovery program, Ghana was producing 230 ounces of gold, which by 1997 had reached 800,000. Cocoa production had also gone up by 400,000 tons in 1997. In 1999-2000, there was, uh, I would call it, a little bit of an economic shock. First of all, gold prices went down to a record low of 200 and 30, 250 uh, dollars per ounce. Cocoa went a record low to almost 700 dollars per ton. And at that time, um, an increase in oil price to 40 was considered an energy crisis in the world in those days. So if you had these three uh, international uh, or external shocks, then it would destabilize the economy. Because first of all, we didn't have enough reserves through the sale of cocoa and gold to support the currency. Then even for the national budget, we also did not get enough for the fiscal budget. And then the foreign exchange situation in Bank of Ghana was also um, uh, distorted. So as a result of that, we lost all the macroeconomic stability that was achieved throughout these years. So I would um, um, say that the destabilization were as a result of this extreme In December 2000, the Rawlings era came to an end after almost 20 years. This was the longest, surpassing even in Chroma in the history of Ghana. The NDC had been defeated in elections, which had as contestant Professor John Evans Atta Mills, Rawlings Vice President from 1996 to 2000. The new patriotic party, Ghana's ancient Liberal Democratic Party, had been in the wilderness for almost 40 years, until John Adjikum Kafour's inauguration on January 2001. But the NPP came to power when state control as a model of economic development which was popular in the 1960s had been displaced by market liberal economies globally. Well, let me, one thing is very clear. Every Ghanaian wants to own something. If you are a fisherman or you are a cooperative working uh, fishing, what you want to do is to be able to own your own canoe. When the MPP government talks about property owning. It does not mean just houses, but owning your own property. You know, owning anything which you can use to do your work. Okay? If I'm a farmer, I don't have to go and borrow or, or have uh, socially provided cutlasses. I have my own cutlasses and I have my own tools of trade to work. I own my farm. It's not owned, you know, by all of us. Ghanaians like to say that this, I have worked for it, and this is mine. And I think that is all uh, property owning uh, democracy is uh, about. The, the macroeconomy has been performing well. The Ghana investment. Uh, the new government liked to talk about its inheritance before anything else. Dr. Anthony Okoto Asay, an economist, returned from the United States as a professor to work with the Center for Policy Analysis, became special advisor to the first Kafour Minister of Finance. Yao Asofo Mafu served also as deputy minister before being made minister of state all from 1995. The, all the typical indicators were in the wrong direction. I mean, the city had depreciated about f almost 50%. Inflation had hit well over 41. Uh, the economic growth was not the best. Reserves were up to about, I think, one to two weeks level of imports. And there's no way you can run an economy with such indicators. Interest rates those days were the uh, T-bill rate was around 45. I mean, things were really not in the best framework. We were, we had been paying our bills, uh, external debt, 
consistently. But after that, there was nothing else left to do any serious uh, development program. I think around 1998, we SEPA had started giving indications that uh, where we're headed was not the best. And 1999, of course, it got worse in 2000. Uh, but I think by end of 97 going to 98, it was clear to us at SEPA that if things didn't change radically uh, by the time we got to the elections, uh, and um, uh, allegedly the former Minister of Finance at that time, Mr. Kwame Pra, was saying that any government that world will have a difficulty managing the economy. And he was, he was right, we found out. Stimulation to the economy in this executive presidency that the 1992 constitution had adopted was partly through what Kafour had called economic diplomacy. It melted on the hardened positions of multilateral advice. DKSA had worked in the diplomatic service for 32 years, serving three presidents, including Kafour, whose secretary he became in 2001. He sat through all the major discussions on the economy of the Kafour tenure. Along with the reform program which the president wanted to institute as soon as he took over power, there were major, major decisions to be made. I mean, about monetary policy, about uh, currency reform, about uh, uh, relations with the fund and the bank, and mostly about HIPIC, which then uh, implied a lot of other decisions like the energy sector deregulation, about budgetary deficits. Now, that process of taking the decision about HIPIC was a very torturous route. Because first of all, you know, you had to demonstrate that you had put in place uh, sound policies to stabilize the macro situation. And because we were having these discussions not only with the fund and the bank, but with all the interested donor parties which would be involved in the multi-donor budgetary uh, fund. And I find, without mentioning it, but the, when I hear people talking about how Ghana took the decision to go epic, I just laugh because I can tell you today that most members of the economic management team were against going to EPIC. And so you can, you can imagine the debates that we had. But the president took a firm decision that it was in the interest of this country to ensure that the overhang of debt would be, would be moving. In fact, I can tell you when the decision was finally made. The decision was made the morning the budget was going to be read. And that decision was taken by the president to me over a telephone conversation after all the discussions that we had had. He called you at home? Yes, I was at home and he, he said, can you wake up? I said, yes, sir. what is it about? Have you got a copy of the draft budget? I said, yes, sir. Says, look, I want you to, to uh, go through the following paragraphs with me. And he actually started dictating the portions about Ghana deciding to go epic. So then, of course, after I'd, he'd given me his rendition, I then spoke to the chairman of the economic management team, the finance minister, and in the end, uh, it turned up in the budget. Many of these economic benefits were also personality driven. Kafour had a philosophical attitude of personally intervening in economic strategies. He has to date made the most presidential travels to all corners of the world for bilateral and multilateral purposes in search of access to development finance and direct foreign investment. But then, you know, there's something that must be said for the president. A lot of people don't trust politicians. They come across as not believing what they, they're saying. But the impression you get when you sit through some of these meetings with his colleagues who lead countries which usually contribute to our economy. The impression one gets is that they trust him. Mm -hmm. I'm talking of Chirac, Bush, uh, the Ch Chinese Prime Minister, President, the former Prime Minister of uh, uh, Japan, the one who's retired. Just to give you an example, Ko Koizumi. Koizumi. We recently went to see uh, Prime Minister Abe officially. In the evening, Koizumi sent a message that he wouldn't let the president leave Japan without having a private dinner with him. And we went and had dinner with Koizumi, just to tell you the kind of relationship he developed with them. 
The big thing, however, was the seemingly embarrassing singular act of declaring the country's poor and the benefits that HIPIC brought. Debt forgiveness, more development finance, the country ratings by Fitch and Standards & Poor's was B+. This meant it could access finance from international markets and had good environment for business. Soon the country will win the 2007 Emerging Market Bond of the Year and the Eastern Europe, Middle East and Africa Bond of the Year. It could have been wrong. I, haven't, I don't see there's a tremendous gain, tremendous gain. Uh, I'm trying to recall some numbers uh, now. I know that certainly for Africa as a continent, the HIPIC program has delivered somewhere in the neighborhood of, if I, my memory serves me right, 35 to 40 billion dollars. So maybe, you know, four billion dollars of that was for Ghana uh, in net present value terms. Um, so it's certainly, and I don't see what the loss was. I mean, we are no, we in fact are more credit worthy now because of HIPIC than of any possible stigma that HIPIC would have given us. Now, the only thing is, now that our debt capacity is low and we're able to borrow quite uh, well, although the financial crisis today is another complication, we have to be absolutely sure that we don't get into that trap again. It led to further confidence, foreign exchange cover for three months and more inter-ministerial policy or linkages. There was a boom in public infrastructure development, more primary schools, renovation of old ones, expansion of public universities, including an Olympic-sized stadium, the construction for the first time of a presidential administration and residence since independence. At the cost of over a $40 million grant from the Indian government, it was seen by some opposition leaders and independent commentators as irresponsible in the midst of poverty. But certainly the road network dominated. For a long time, the triangular rail network from Accra to Takaradi, from Takaradi to Kumasi, had collapsed. It was the same with roads and aviation, although previous governments had started some form of repairs and gone through some phases to correct these. Uh, however, this government thought it necessary to pay a little more attention uh, to these sectors. Uh, we even started uh, passenger transportation from Nsawam to Accra and as we, as we speak now, now the line from Tema to Accra is virtually rehabilitated and uh, uh, passenger transport can, can start. Um, the line from Accra to um, Sekendi or Takradi is yet to be rehabilitated. I know that uh, virtually all the lines are going to be rehabilitated because government had prioritize the revamping of the rail infrastructure in order to get it on and even to extend it up to Paga so that we can link the southern sector to the northern sector and one of the major ripoffs that we hope we can get is to first equalize prices of goods and food as well as improve on uh, the relocation or location of industries up north. Roads are an essential component of the communication infrastructure of a country, creation of access, the movement of people from one point to the other in order to facilitate socio-economic activity. It also has to do with movements of goods and services. In Ghana, 95% of passenger traffic is by the road sector and 97% of haulage of goods is by the road sector. If you are to take the national mix, uh, that's trunk roads, feeder roads, urban roads and all the other roads mix. Again, if you look at the road condition mix, in 2001, I didn't want to go back to 2000, I just said 2000 because that's when this government came in. 2001, by the end of 2001, the road condition mix showed that 27% of the roads were in good condition nationally, all the roads. 17% were in fair condition and 56% were in poor condition. By 2004, 40% uh, of these roads were in good condition, 30% were in fairly good condition and the remaining 30% were in poor condition. By the end of 2006, 
45% have been raised to very good condition, 28% in fair condition, and just 27% were in poor condition. And uh, if we were to take the results of ne uh, last year, that's 2007, which are being collated and which will be available by March, we will find that there will be a steady change, which will show that there has been a marked improvement in the national road condition mix. Now, if you appreciate the road condition mix, that will tell you how the road looked like when the government came in and how it is now. And that shows the kind of inputs and investments the government have made in improving upon the roads and by so doing also to increase and improve on access and facilitate the socio-economic activities of people in the movement of goods and services. <laughs> What this did for cash crops, though not new, helped with production and exports. For instance, the Cocoa Bod had a partnership with the Ministry of Finance and Department of Feeder Roads, which tarred roads leading to cocoa producing areas. And it had indirect or direct value effect. We do have quite a number of processing industries and it is the policy of uh, the present government to ensure that processing capacity increases to at least 40%. Uh, since 2000, we've had um, Barry Calibut, one of the, in fact, the world's biggest chocolate manufacturer operating in our country. They set up a 30,000 ton capacity factory which was opened by His Excellency the President. And um, uh, not too long ago, about a year or so ago, they have uh, expanded that capacity to 60,000 tons. A few months ago, we signed a bean supply agreement with um, ADM, which is, uh, so we have the big, the three big boys in Ghana, you know. ADM will set up their factory in Kumasi. Um, apart from that, we've had two other smaller factories, you know, Afrotropic um, and um, yet another factory. So we are looking at a capacity of about 350,000 tons. So by the end of next year. So clearly you can see that uh, we will exceed, given the present level of production, we will exceed the 40% uh, percent which uh, government has targeted. Agriculture, which currently, 2008 terms, has about 45% share of the economy, has a GDP component that does not match its population. And it has engaged in not only because of cash crops, such as cocoa, but to feed the nation, most crops, corn, plantain, cassava and rice, are grown in the country. But some, like rice and fisheries, are supplemented with imports, running into hundreds of millions of dollars annually. Women play an important role in this sector, as well as in the fisheries. First, as farmers and traders in the produce from the hinterland, to the urban areas such as Kumasi and Accra. Whilst cash crops like cocoa have extension offices and institutions that guide producers and to some extent commercial farmers, subsistence agriculture, which is still the bigger practice, is at rudimentary stages. There is still a great deal of post-harvest losses and low productivity due to many reasons. <laughs> Time was when we had a hungry season in Ghana. You know, it was normal that we would have a period of plenty during the harvest, but agriculture would not guarantee that 365 days in a year you will have food, and that the price fluctuations would not, not be very dramatic. That's the situation we have now. The hungry period is gone. It means we have 365 days of agriculture. It's been managed in such a manner that uh, we do not suffer from famine during any particular uh, period. Women also dominate the informal sector in an economy in which the biggest employer is government. Food sufficiency has been witnessed in most period of the Kafour administration, but still scientific farming beyond the present 
is the desirable situation. But then any economy can decline or rise because of linkages to international systems and agreements, with multilateral institutions including the World Trade Organization, markets and fluctuations in commodity prices. Professor John Evans at a Mills looks at the records differently. These days, you know, with all the so-called geniuses, you know, who are members of the Kufo economic management team, your domestic primary balance is in the negative. Mm. You are not achieving your targets. You are recording physical deficits. Mm. And let me tell you, you can look at the records. Even in the years, the four years, when I was chairman of the economic management team, we were recording surpluses in the domestic primary balance, mm. which is something. And let us also uh, be mindful of this fact, which people run away from. At the time that we were in power, Cocoa was selling at 700, gold was 235. Now, uh, cocoa is selling at about $3,000, and as gold is close to 1,000, because of what we did, we handed over peacefully, we opened the doors, and therefore, debt cancellation um, running into billions. This is one government, the Kufo government has had more resources to deal with mm. than any other government, and yet, there's little to show for it as far as the ordinary Ghanaian is concerned. And yet, they pride themselves, you know, on being the economic gurus. Well, we'll live to see. By 2007, however, some of the public policies pursued by the Kufo administration had yielded positive results with some underlining challenges, as well over 10 million Ghanaians had registered for the National Health Insurance Scheme a policy which it promised would be pursued when in opposition to replace the cash and carry system. It has relieved millions of people of health burdens. There had also been the capitation grants, which allow children of school age to go to school without payment of fees, coupled with the school feeding programme, which gives children a meal a day in school. These children and the underage in many parts of the country also board public buses introduced by the government free of charge and then maternal health care for mothers and infants. Though these have had some criticisms, studies conducted show that they have produced far more excellent results than the weakness inherent in them. Uh, the capitation grant is a grant meant for the school to help in the provision of uh, sporting and cultural items, uh, you know, to help in that wise. The school feeding program is helping the parents a lot. And I think even uh, the school, it's also helping the school in that uh, they now come to school very regularly. Even when they are late, they want to come. Unlike at first, if they were late, they will run away. Some will be playing truant and others. But this time, we always get full class every day because they know at least when they come, they have something to fill their tummies. And uh, we can see from our children, they are all growing plumpy. It means uh, something is going on. Energy-giving foods are cereals and grains, as well as starchy roots and plantain, white sobu, cassava, cocoa yam, yam and plantain. <laughs> Dr. Ellen Botai Dokua Yete, Director of the Centre for Social Policy Studies at the University of Ghana, has conducted some research into policy implication of some of these. It is clear that, as all the reports have indicated, this has improved enrollment, clearly. However, there is still a large uh, issue related to quality which has not, does not appear to have been touched by capitation and school feeding. So these measures have brought children to the classroom in anticipation of one good meal, which is very good. And I think it's something that we have to find the resources to continue. But the issue of quality, 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 of quality education, quality access, uh, quality, access to quality health care, these are areas that I'm afraid um, capitation and school feeding alone uh, will not resolve. It calls for other measures, which um, I think um, 
now we have to sit down and, and uh, seriously uh, discuss. Despite its teething problems, the school feeding program, if it becomes sustainable, would be a major legacy. Jeffrey Sachs, international economist at the Earth Institute at Columbia University, is credited with the initiative for the Millennium Development Goals as advisor to the UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. The school feeding program is a commitment that every child in Ghana in school will have a midday meal. It hasn't yet reached everybody, but it is reaching hundreds of thousands of children. And this is a big step forward. The world is looking because Ghana was the first to say, we'll do it for everybody. And everybody's rooting for Ghana's success to achieve the full success of this project. I think it's extremely important for a number of reasons. One, brings the children to school. Second, it helps them to learn uh, because when they're fed, they can be more attentive. Uh, it helps with long-term physical development of the children, of course, with better nutrition. But it also can help the local farm community. If the school feeding program is based on purchasing foodstuffs from local villages, uh, it builds a commercial economy locally. And this is how I would like the school feeding program to work, that it's uh, building by buying from small grower farmers, providing a market for them. Then those farmers can become commercial farmers. They can buy fertilizer and better seeds so that they can have a higher yield and then the benefits of the school feeding program itself can uh, take place inside the schools. Dr. Bote Doku says the Department of Social Welfare had suffered for decades for lack of attention but hopeful some of these new interventions put in place since 2007 such as the National Social Protection Strategy of the Ministry of Manpower, Youth and Sports and especially the livelihood empowerment against poverty would help. It is intended to directly target poor households, extremely poor households in Ghana. It's anticipated that the major beneficiaries will be women and children. So steps are being taken. And in fact, in a couple of months, you will hear about the launch of this um, initiative known as Livelihood Empowerment Against Poverty, or LEAP, for sure, which is intended to provide uh, some kind of support to these very poor households, um, identifying in particular uh, women as um, caretakers, you know, caregivers of households, to give them support to enable children to go to school. There will be conditions that to, to benefit Children have to go to school. Um, the family has to be registered with a national health insurance policy. So women and children stand to gain from the new initiatives that are coming on. You will find similar uh, references in the Ghana Poverty Reduction Strategy, which is now Ghana Growth and Poverty Reduction Strategy. Again, there's a focus on improving the conditions of women and children as vulnerable and excluded groups. It does not equate to absence of social ills. There are still issues of child health based on the Ghana Demographic and Health Survey. There have been reversals between 1998 and 2003 in areas like stunting, wasting, infant mortality for which the National Health Insurance seeks to partly address. Development issues would be with this post-colonial economy for a while because issues of development take a while to deal with. It also takes time for and disagreements to settle as to which direction a policy should take. You see, here you are, you have a government whose domestic primary balance, that is its revenues, as against expenditure. In 2007, it was 6.7 negative of GDP which means that the government spent more than it collected. In 2006, it was 4.6 negative GDP, domestic primary balance, negative, which means that it spent more than it, it, it collected. And yet this is a government which is talking about meeting targets. Now, in 2007, the government had a budget deficit of close to 10%. And if you look at the record, 2007 and 2007, the government did not meet a lot of its performance targets. So when they are saying that they've, they've been able to read their targets, then why is the domestic primary balance the way it is? 
President Kufor is one of Africa's great leaders. Uh, he's a great Democrat. Uh, he's a man of uh, great dignity and consistency. Uh, he uh, is somebody that everybody looks up to when Kenya's in crisis. Uh, we turn to President Kufor to uh, help resolve the crisis uh, because President Kufor is someone that people count on uh, and uh, to be open, democratic, uh, and very far-sighted. So for me, <coughs> it's been an enormous pleasure to work with President Kufor. It's not that he hasn't had his hands full with crisis from the day that he came in. Uh, energy, uh, water, food, health care, uh, aid promised but not delivered. So it's not been easy. It isn't easy for an African leader and an African democratic leader. But think of how respected he is and how and people admire him and can count on his consistent follow-through. And that's a, a great accomplishment. And he uh, has made a, a great mark and I think set a very high standard for leadership. Yes,